Thank you very much. Thank you. Boy, Jim Billington and the Library of Congress put on a hell of a book party, <laughs> don't they? This is, this is so wonderful. Listen, before we start, um, I always feel compelled to inoculate myself after such a, in, a generous introduction as that. Dayton and I live in a tiny little town in New Hampshire. He's lived there for 20 years. I've lived there for 30 years. Um, there are more people under this tent than are in this town. <laughs> Um, I've had on my refrigerator an old and now faded editorial cartoon that shows two men standing in hell, the flames licking up around them, and one guy says to the other, apparently my over 200 screen credits didn't mean a damn thing. <laughs> but Maria, I thank you nonetheless for your generous uh, I introduction. I'm also thinking of the Civil War and the Union soldiers' complaint about Tullahoma, Tennessee, where they were stationed in one cold, wet, wet rainy winter. They said that Tullahoma came from the Greek word tulla, meaning mud, and homa, meaning more mud. <laughs> Ten years ago, Dayton and I were working on a film about Mark Twain. And we had the great good fortune to meet and interview the novelist Russell Banks at his Adirondacks home. Uh, we were speaking about Twain and his genius, but specifically about Huckleberry Finn, which he said, and we agreed, was Twain's best work. But he went farther. He said, this was our Iliad and our Odyssey. And we really set up straight. He said that though we all, or most of us, share the same European traditions as the producer of the Iliad and the Odyssey, we Americans were grappling with two themes that the Europeans had not dealt with. And therefore, we needed someone to come and write our own Iliad and Odyssey. And he said, Twain alone among politicians, philosophers, artists, writers of the 19th century, not only understood these twin themes, but was willing to go into them, to deal with them, uh, to engage them in almost all of the works that he did. And those two twin themes were race and space. And the space is not outer, but the physical space of the United States. And Dayton and I felt that they, he had been describing our work for the last then 20 years and now 30 years. That is to say, our exploration, as Joe Ellis interpreted from our most recent book, uh, is asking this deceptively simple question, who are we? Who are those strange and complicated people who like to call themselves Americans? What does an investigation of the past tell us about not only where we've been, but where we are and where we may be going? And while we can never answer the question in the end, we can possibly deepen it with each successive project. And we realize that over the breadth of the, our professional lives, we have constantly, as we have explored the depths of American history, run into this idea of race. The great sin and stain of slavery we inherited at our founding, which is responsible not only for bedeviling our American narrative, but also ennobling it in so many different ways. But we have also been drawn inexorably to a question of space, to that physicality of our continent, which has in so many ways formed and shaped us. And in films specifically that I have been able to do with my best friend, Dayton Duncan, from our town of Walpole, New Hampshire, on the West, on Lewis and Clark, on Mark Twain, on Horatio's Drive, we have tried to come to terms with all of the contradictory and exultant themes that uh, sort of come to the surface when you deal with our continent and its magnificent promise. This interest has come to its head. It represents its apotheosis for us in exploration of the national parks. The film that WETA in this town and PBS uh, across the nation will begin broadcasting tomorrow. And by the way, WETA is broadcasting it at 10, 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10 again uh, tomorrow. So don't tell me on Monday morning you didn't know when it was on. <laughs> the film that they are broadcasting represents, as Maria said, a 10-year effort on our part. It is a history 
of the national parks. It is not a travelogue. It is not a nature film per se, though we think it has beautiful images of nature. It is not a recommendation of which lodge or inn to stay at when you take your family on vacation. Rather, it is a history of the ideas and individuals that made this uniquely American thing happen. For the first time in human history, land was set aside not for kings or noblemen or the rich, as all land had been disposed through all of human history, but for everyone, all of you, and for all time. We love the idea that this was an American invention. Like our idea of freedom has been exported around the world. In fact, we began to understand that the film we were making was the story of the Declaration of Independence applied to the landscape. It was a growing, evolving idea, just like the United States. And you, it was a prism through which one could see refracted much more than the history of adding beautiful spaces or wildlife or historical sites to this collection of parks. It was something more that got to the essence of us. And so we have pursued this tale for a long time. And the film we tell, the book that echoes that film, it introduces you to 50 or 60 human beings, most of whom you've never heard of. They come from every walk of life and every conceivable uh, background. The story of American history is usually the story of great men, capital G, capital M, and ye are nearly always white. We, fought, we think of American history as a succession of presidential administrations punctured by wars. It is not. The best of our history comes from the bottom up. And as it turns out, the story of the national parks naturally occurring is as diverse as this country. It is a story that is black and brown and red and yellow and female and unknown as much is, as it is a story of white famous males. Uh, it is a totally bottom up story. And it is a story of unusual drama. It is not Bambi in the woods. <laughs> Human beings, and particularly Americans, are acquisitive and extractive. Some have even accused us of rapacious animals. We look at a river and we think, damn. We look at a stand of trees and we think bored feet. We look at a canyon and we wonder what mineral wealth we could extract. And so every time we added a park to our system, there was a huge drama, great resistance, and unbelievable forbearance on the part of the people who dedicated their lives and fortunes and sacred honor to this. And so it represents a kind of best of us, a, a progress in the best sense of the word, and an evolution of our idea of freedom. Thomas Jefferson started off by saying all men are created equal, but of course he meant all white men of property free of debt. We don't mean that anymore, do we? Do we? So too, the National Park set off to set aside obvious national, uh, spectacular natural scenery. But we also began to save uh, complicated archaeological sites. We began to save historical sites, diverse habitats like the Everglades, part of our social and military and uh, political history. Uh, we saved the symbols of our great republic, the Statue of Liberty, Mount Rushmore, the Lincoln Memorial, this mall, these museums. These are all part of a much larger sense of bringing in the story of America into the idea of the national parks so we weren't just reflecting our geological history or our ancient ethnographic history, but all of American history, and we have been willing to deal with the most complicated parts of it too. So that Manzanar, where Japanese American citizens were shamefully interned during the Second World War, is a site of the National Park Service. Little Rock, Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, still a working inner city high school, is a unit of the National Park Service where in 1957 the crisis of school desegregation came to a head. Shanksville, Pennsylvania, where United 93 went down, is a unit of the National Park Service. So is Oklahoma City. Everywhere we turn, our great republic has been greater because it's been willing to encompass all of its history. This is but a fraction of the story we've tried to tell in this six-part, 12-hour series and in this book.